Hello, everybody, and welcome to this October edition of the IU's Global Out video. Uh, my name is Tom Rafferty. I'm the head of global forecasting at the IU, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Josh Bailey, uh, based in, in New York. With Josh, I want to talk a bit about, as we come into the last, towards the last quarter of 24, um, think a bit about what might be shaping the agenda in 2025. So, Josh, one thing that we are predicting and forecasting for next year is is a slowdown in the US economy. Um, we begin to see that already in the data. We think it will become more pronounced next year. Um, how much of a slowdown do you think we're talking about in the case of the US economy? Because given how strong the US economy has been in recent years, how impactful will this be for the rest of the world? I mean, Tom, you know, where you end there, I think, is where we sort of begin, which is that the US economy has been remarkably resilient in the last couple of years. And as you say, whilst we're starting to see uh, signs that growth is beginning to slow, uh, the economy remains broadly resilient. Uh, you know, growth firmed up in the first half of 2024. There's been relatively robust job creation. Household finances continue to drive good consumer spending. But as you say, we see a slowing outlook going into 2025. I think that is predominantly driven by how we see the labour market, which is certainly starting to cool at this point. We're seeing uh, cracks in the in, in job creation uh, and a general slowing in, in the environment that workers are, are, are experiencing. There's certainly a part of that where high interest rates are certainly taking a toll and the Fed is, we expect, about to embark upon a cycle of interest rate cutting that will provide some support to households and will prop up job creation. But despite all of that, you know, I think the product of all of, of, of these these effects coming together will be that we see uh, you know, growth will ease quite sharply in the second half of this year as a result of interest rates starting to to bite on output, and we expect that to flow through to domestic demand, which will you know remain strong enough to prevent a kind of technical recession, but you know we'll certainly see growth slowing down. So, you know, in overall terms, we think you know, real real GDP growth will be about two point four percent in twenty twenty four, but then slowing quite considerably to one point four percent next year. And this is despite the fact that we you know, obviously expect the Federal Reserve to begin loosening interest rates. Um, you know, that slowdown in the US as a significant source of global demand will weigh on our outlook for, for the global economy as well. So we now forecast that real global GDP will expand about 2.6% a year on average over the next five years. And that's below the 3% of the of, of the 2010s, which was hardly a, a stellar decade for the global economy uh, in the first place. Yeah, I think if you look globally next year, we have a slowdown in the US and we have China continuing to slow. So it's difficult to sort of identify areas of accelerating growth next year. Europe is one example of that in our forecast, but Europe is growing from quite a weak, quite a low base. So I think everyone will struggle to say that Europe's economic performance is likely to be strong next year. So I think growth headwinds for next year seem quite pronounced. Um, what else is 25, Josh? I mean, one theme that has dominated the global economy in recent years has been the US-China relationship. We had this low point on Adir in 2022. Things seem to have got better since then. Um, there's a bit more strategic stability in the relationship. Taiwan had an election this year, which sure produced a lot of rhetoric on all sides, but at the end of the day, went through peacefully. Um, so how, and I know obviously with the US election coming around the corner, there's a lot of caveats on how this may go, but how are you looking at the US-China relationship for, for 2025? Is it still going to be an issue that dominates the global economy? Or is it um, slightly more predictable going forwards? I, I mean, I think you're right, Tom, that I think we would see, you know, the US-China relationship continuing to be a sort of central organizing principles for the two for the two states for the foreseeable future. You know, they're both very much in each other's minds and they will continue to drive policy in both Washington and Beijing. But I think as you're alluding to there, I think we see some moderation, some some guardrails, as the two sides like to talk about, being put around. The relationship and whilst we'd expect competition to continue across this sort of full range of domains from trade and finance to technology and a potential conflict in the strait there is some effort on both sides that we can see to to sort of moderate things and to make sure that the if you like the tail risks of ex escalation are being managed on both sides and you know that's really exemplified in this current round of diplomacy that we're seeing between between the two capitals which as you say started at the very nadir point of the relationship in in late 2023 when you know the us and chinese leaders met in california and has really culminated in the visit uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago of the us national security advisor jake sullivan to beijing where he established or formalized this strategic channel of communication as both sides are referring to it you know i think that shows some commitment from both sides to try and manage the the tensions in the relationship even if 
you know, competition will continue across a, a range of fronts. The risk, of course, is that this sort of uneasy truce that we're currently observing is an arrangement that exists between the two executives. And, you know, there remains a bipartisan consensus in Congress that further confrontation with China is justified. And, and we expect to continue to see that in the legislative agenda that, that, that comes through Congress, irrespective of who controls, controls both houses uh, next year. And obviously, we'd also expect to see a significant deterioration in the relationship if we if we saw a change in party in the White House as well. So, you know, I think our baseline would be an executive executive relationship under a democratic administration, one that stabilizes, um, but one uh, where we see a change in party in the White House. You know, we, we'd expect deterioration again in 2025. And looking elsewhere for, for geopolitics, obviously, US China has been a dominant issue um, in 24 situation in the Middle East ongoing conflict in uh, between Russia and Ukraine. As we look to 25, are there, are there sort of geopolitical surprises or risks that are perhaps a little bit underpriced at the moment because of the dominance of those three issues, those three conflict issues? What would be your sort of one or two picks for geopolitical risks to watch in 25? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two, I suppose, that are on my, on my mind, Tom. Yeah, firstly, you know, we're all rightfully very focused on the Middle East and what's been going on since the events of October 7th, 2023. I, I still think the risk of some kind of escalation there, specifically related to the Iranian nuclear situation, is probably relatively underpriced. And, you know, I think specifically the risk of some sort of confluence of an escalation around the conflict in Gaza and some breakdown in diplomacy uh, around the nuclear deal, uh, you know, you could see a, a very sharp escalation because of the red lines that Israel and the United States have set in terms of preventing uh, Iran acquiring a weapon. Now, we have a new uh, regime in Iran, one which has signaled its openness to resuming diplomacy around the nuclear agreement. But, you know, ultimately, this issue remains politically very challenging for both Tehran and, and Washington. You know, in Washington, especially in Congress, you know, there can affect be no tolerance at all for 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 any risk that, that Iran could access a weapon, uh, and similarly in, in Iran, you know they will not unreasonably be expecting large sanctions relief to give the economy some support in the short term before they're willing to engage in in, in serious diplomacy around around the nuclear deal. So you know fundamentally, even though there's more interest in a, in a deal in in Tehran, the fundamental issues here are still pretty intractable, and uh, 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 and again, it's intolerable to 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 Israel in the US to see Iran acquire a weapon. So I, I still think some kind of escalation around the nuclear deal is something that we're watching. And then secondly, you know, it, it kind of pops back onto our radar periodically, often around some sort of weapons test. It feels relatively quiet right now, but I'd be looking at the Korean Peninsula. You know, we have a we have a new, uh, still relatively new uh, conservative leader in 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 the South who is much less interested in nuclear diplomacy uh, with the North than his predecessor Moon Jae-in was. And I think, you know, if 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 the North wants to resume some sort of saber rattling, which we think would be particularly likely if Trump were to return to the White House, you could see again another escalation on the Korean Peninsula. And I think at the moment we're not watching it because, as you say, there are these other geopolitical domains that we are rightfully focused on. But I'd also be also watching the Korean Peninsula. OK, thanks, Josh. So that's uh, Iran and North and North Korea. Familiar risks, but uh, ones which might pop up again in, in 25. Um, so thanks, Josh, for joining us today and for the sharing your insights. And thank you all for joining us and tune in next month for our next edition of the IO's Global Outlook video. Thank you.